changed quite a bit. It used to be sort of short implants might be a 10 mil, might be a short implant now. 10 mil implants are, uh, are using a reasonable amount. More like a 7 or 8 mil implant we call a short implant. Um, grafted cases again, we tend not to do it, but then you've got to remember there's grafted and there's grafted. There's little graft, we have a little bone at the same time as the implant, or there's a graft we're talking from the hip or you know, the mandible or bios, bio, bovine bios, bone, whatever. And the other really big thing is the insertion torque. This is almost a sort of an absolute. And the insertion torque for those of you who don't do implants, so when the surgeon puts in the implant, it does what's called an osteotomy. It's like putting in a power post. When we teach the courses, I, I show a bunch of post slides. If you're doing a post, you, you do the drills up into the root canal, hopefully, on that side, and then you get the next drill, the next drill, and then you, you make the post. Well, the surgeon for the implant does an osteotomy where it gets a drill, it drills into the jawbone, then the next side, the next size. And depending on how dense the bone is, that tells me how hard, how high to crank up the machine, the torque, the torque driver or the torque wrench. So, to do it. so what we try and do is get up that we can get about 35 newton centimetres or plus before we think about loading that implant. And I'll show some other things on that in a minute. <coughs> Again, power function, if they've got a lot of power function, we are on the side of not doing it because the implant is integrated with this baby. Now, this is not all sort of absolute. It's sort of another how many, how many, um, uh, how many of those things you've got against you. So, you know, the more of these black ticks you've got against you, the more likely you are not to load it, okay? It becomes a, a bit of a judgment call as well. Now, um, in relation to single teeth, uh, there's some guidelines. First of all, we don't want too much infection. Now, I used to say no infection. 20 years ago, there wouldn't be a surgeon in the world that would take this tooth out and do an implant. Today, most of them, I would say, would do it. We'll put it this way, they would not be put off by this periapical area. This tooth's been endo twice, had an apicectomy once, maybe twice, I don't know. It's had three goes on it, and at the end of it, I said, it's time to bail out. So whether an implant you put in there at the same time as the extraction, or you extract the tooth and then wait a couple of months and then do it, that decision, in the way we work it, is made by the surgeon. Okay? So the certain decisions I make, you know, whether to use an Australian crown, zirconia, Empress, PFM, how many implants, and all sorts of things I make, but I don't decide whether they can put an implant in there or not. The surgeon tells me. You know, that we have a very, you know, you're the same guy over the last 20 plus years, had a good working relationship. So we could hopefully put an implant in, but we decide that the other big critical thing is that's, that decision is usually made when the surgery occurs. I'll explain that more in a minute. So on general extraction, the other thing that comes out of this is we get phone calls sometimes with you know, one of you guys who says, look, you know, I've got Mr. Smith in the chair, the sample's had it, I want to take it out and send him along. Nine times out of ten, yes, you know, don't take it out. Um, and temporise it either with an endo dressing or decoronate the ginger will do a partial overdenture or a suspension bridge because <coughs> the, our protocol is, my protocol is, the guy that puts in the implant has to be the guy that takes out the tooth. You don't want, and not that you, know, you guys can't take the tooth out, you, but um, you want the surgeon to make sure that they cure it, socket, they can investigate how bone there is. There's no question about you know, leaving bits behind. So, <coughs> excuse me. The guy that puts the implant in should be the guy that takes the tooth out. And if the patient's not sure whether um, you know, they're going to go for the implant, <coughs> then essentially um, you try and temporise without doing extraction. Except if there's a lot of saturation, a huge amount of swelling, lots of pus everywhere, all that leads to bone loss anyway. So keeping the tooth in that situation is counterproductive. So you might as well take it out. You're going to need a bone graft anyway. Okay? Sometimes you get a kid that's, say, 16 and fall off the swing and they're too young for implants. And you might be able to decoronate, put an endo dressing or not, and then temporise with maybe a partial overdenture, um, suspension bridge, whatever. And that root, if it's healthy, will help keep the bone there in the old process. So. Um, we try, if you're going to do this immediate, you want good stability of the implant. So to do that, you see when the socket comes out there, 
All that's left of the labial plate is that little bit of bone there. If you lose that, you could be in a bit of trouble. So you won't, you won't have to graft, you won't have to, you won't have to graft, um, you won't be able to do it immediately, simple as that. And if you correct the soft tissue. The other thing is that, look, you know, you want the implant to pass the soft for stability. Well, that's not really true. <clears throat> you can't always get it past the soft for starters, you can up central in the nose. Um, what you want is the implant stable. Now, it could be, it could be um, uh, not going past the soft for at all. What you want is to be stable and the point that where what we, we use as a guideline is you can get past 30, 35 newton centimetres. And that can occur by the fact that it's gone past the socket, it can occur that it hasn't gone fully in, uh, engaged to hold the socket. So just because it's gone past the socket does not mean it's going to be stable. Just because it hasn't, it hasn't gone past the socket doesn't mean it's not going to be stable. So that going past the socket is sort of, these days, it's almost dream time. What we want is stability. If we go past, it's still not stable, and vice versa. Um, we certainly want to treat an implant surface. That means basically the rough surface, or, or textured surface, as some companies call it. The idea of having a rough or textured surface is it's going to bind to the bone stronger. And the idea of this is going to be putting vision on there in a day or two. So you want something that, 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 you want a smooth surface implant, you want a textured or rough. You want to tapered because a you get better primary stability, and B, it lends itself to the shape of the upper central root a lot better than the parallel side of the implant. Um, this optimised use, optimised use of the pallet wall. Um, if you go on the lecture circuit and you sort of listen to the guy after or before you, a lot of surgeons talk about this, and I've talked about it a few times, I talk about it on swimming upstream. I don't agree with this, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I just, I have difficulty this thing that there's a catch cry as a lot of surgeons go, well, you know, because it's immediate, we can go and go to the power wall for stability. And I'll show you what happens. Um, the other thing is if there's too big a discrepancy between the wall of the um, implant and the socket, then no wall will be. Okay? But you've got to be, if they get compromised smokers, many people, all hygiene, poor bone, um, all these other uh, criteria, then we don't do it. Simple as that. Okay, so look, in summary, um, it's very desirable to carry an immediate placement where possible, with immediate function, I'm sort of using the correct sense, we still call it, call it immediate bone detection function because it's not inclusion, um, because you get good biologic response. Um, the difference between uh, multiple restorations and full arches we'll do later on is um, they're slurred together. So they've got, they, they got stability against each other, if you like. And you've got all those selection criteria which I've talked about, which I've talked about all that as well. And again, a reminder that if you don't do it in terms of function loading, if you don't do it in the first sort of two weeks, you wait about two, two, two and a half months. In that case, the longer the better. The big thing is that that decision is made during surgery. So we warn the patient that we're not really sure that wherever we will try and place an implant at the same time, or try and make a vision at the same time. Uh, we don't decide to a surgery. So because they might not end up doing that, we need a fallback, a backup plan. Okay? Otherwise they're going to walk out with no two. One of the things we sort of really promised all the patients would say an upper anterior or an upper premolar some of the time, occasionally. Um, they don't go toothless. They'll either get a, a tooth that's sort of attached to the implant, more of a temporary button and a temporary crown or they'll get this suck down suspension bridge, which you all know what I'm talking about there. It's basically an orthodontic true tank um, with a tooth inside, in a nutshell. So we have plan A in fallback position, which is plan B. That's our backup plan. We'll show this in a minute. The other thing I'd like to talk about, and I'll show you the cases again in a minute, um, is in the emergence profile of the, the, the crown as an abutment in relation to how where the implant's placed. Okay? Now this is one of the favourite sorts of, I could call them slides, not slides, but we used to use slides, these are digital images. This is one of the favourite slides. This patient's going to have all five. And you know, you should all be able to answer this question. I'll ask the questions. Um, that um, gingival margin is much higher, much more apical than that one. And that one's more apical than that. And that one is more you know, apical than that, all that for that. Why, why is that one more apical than that one, Dr. Martin? Bone level. 
The more labelled it's exactly, the more labelled it is, the higher that goes up. Okay? That one is more lingually placed, so the margin is lowering. Often you see the other canines, they've got a lot more recession, and there's no bone around it because, because they're more labelled in place. So not so much the bone or indirectly the bone, but it depends how labial or lingual those teeth are. So that's lingual in place, it's further down. That one is more uh, labelled in place, a bit more than that, so the digital margin is there. Look at that versus that. So what do you think if you're going to put an implant in that kind of situation or that position? Do you think the implant's going to be smarter than the tooth and the gum's not going to do that? Dumber than the tooth. So, you know, this is so, it just tells the whole story in terms of emergence on this one slide. Here's a case in point. This is a different system that was done in Hawaii because America is the best. And then this is broke. And then she wanted, so we managed to retrieve the broken bit. And then I said, well, look, this thing is, is actually outside the labial surface of all the other teeth. So I said, look, you know, you can either to find out the implant, which is not a nice thing to do, and, you know, you're putting out fires, or you can try and restore it. And the way we always, always, one sort of cornerstone of prosthodontics and implant dentistry um, is if you've got a problem, so you down tools and you make it provisional. Simple as that. And then that will tell you, saying, well, it's got a little crap. The provisional tells you it's going to take the implant out. This patient had a low lip line. She was sort of a you know, young 60-year-old, nice lady. And she said, well, let's make it provisional, because otherwise the alternative is to take out that implant. Okay? This is what I call an apple on the stick. Okay? If you've got a tiny stick like that and an apple on there, you know, this emerges to come straight out like a ledge. And when it comes to implants, or teeth for that matter, we don't want an apple on the stick. We want this sort of very smooth, gradual transition. We want a pear on the stick. Okay? This is my own little thing. So um, that's what we're after. That's what we're after. We don't want that. Okay? And this is why, you know, I'll, I'll talk about this more about engaging the carbon wall and having thinner implants and not as deep and all that in a sec. But just remember that. So, you know, you don't want that. And here's another sort of, not an identical, but similar case where you've got this ledge coming out here. Now, you can floss under there, that's fine. But if that was a label surface and up in size and this goes north, then maybe it won't be so good. The good thing with that is you can actually restore that too, and you can restore that too. Um, okay, this power wall I mentioned. Look, there's a big trend, and the problem is there's three parts to this trend, and a lot of people are talking about placing the implant more powerfully to engage the power of the wall. They're also, without a doubt, everyone's going less deep, which is fine. So, you know, it's not as deep anymore. And also, people talk about a smaller diameter implant. Um, whereas for a say, up the central, we often used to use, I used to use uh, a wide platform, you know how big it is. Then you know, might use regular, you might use a narrow even, with a, or a regular platform shift, you know what that is. So there's, you know, this is a case in point. And this is a regular implant that happened to fail on a photo. So what happened was, you know, this is on the pallet. It's not that deep, so it's coming straight out there. Okay, that's not why it failed, but that's not a very good emergence, is it? If this could start up here and gradually come down, like you saw on the other ones, uh, like this, that would be a much better long-term proposition. So, um, there we go. Uh, so, you know, we don't want that, we don't want that. And it's a fine line between doing that and getting that in the middle, isn't it? So, the big thing that, that sort of people don't talk about, which I like and was around before, and I think people should remember, is the greater the size discrepancy between the implant and the crown, and the deeper it needs to be. Now, I'm not saying it should be deep, people sort of misquote me. What I'm saying is that if you're going to make an angle change, then it should start here and gradually come up. If you want to make an angle change from here to here, and this, the implant is shallow, that is going to work very well long term. If you get half the more recession there, you've got to get up to there in, in most, no time. So the greater the angle change, the deeper you want to start it. The, better, the, the, the bigger the discrepancy between the implant slash abutment and the crown, um, the deeper you want to start it. But ideally, Therefore, if you get a sort of regular or even a wide implant, you won't have that discrepancy because you won't have the apple on the stick situation. 
So, you know, you know what just out of the journal, I grabbed it, and they're talking about how good the treatment was. Now, you know, that to do it fast as well as go, well, that's probably not an ideal situation, <coughs> is it? Same as that. You want that, that, and that. Getting back to this lady, I mean, we restored it, and Murphy's Law said, look, that's, that's a pretty good crown. Um, given the fact that there's no room for porcelain, because this thing's so, uh, they're going to hang and build that up, you know, there's nothing. Um, uh, uh, you've got to have a metal abutment because it's, it's thinner, otherwise you've got a sort of ceramic abutment, it's much thicker, and you can't have a screw hole because that would come out about here. Other than that's a perfect case. And you've got the soft tissue that goes up sort of there. So, you know, this is all you're going to see. You just, you know. So that's where it's finished. And like I said, you cover that up and the patient was ecstatic. You know. And Murphy's Law, you know, the worst implant place, the better it integrates. Um, and, uh, you know, the harder the job is, the better result you get. So our technician, was, I was very happy with that result, given that parameter. And that's just a, a larger view. And, you know, that's as good as you want to get. That's the reason we can do. The alternative to that was to take out the implant. The other thing is, like, this is led to, you know, the surgeon or you have got to decide do you want a, a screw hole or a single one, or do you want to come out there, in which case you have a cement crown, you can't have a screw hole there. Oh, there's you that. Um, there are systems that, where you can aim out to what you used to have a screw hole here, but you can get an angle between the button and the implant. It's called an angulated screw channel. Now, several companies have got this. This happens to be the Noble Biocare version of this, and more and more companies are copying each other. So what happens here is the implant's at that angle, but the screw hole is that angle. And you can even do it here where the implant is sort of, say, vertical, and this screw hole is like that, OK? However, in this particular company, Nobel, at the moment, because it's relatively new, last couple of years, you've got to have a conical connection between the abutment so you can't do it on the old external external mark type situation or a trilobe situation and we're going to have a conical connection. Okay? It does allow for a lot more screw retained options. The alternative to this is get the thing in the right place in the first place. But it also allows for the fact that you can reduce the number of bow grafts you need. Because if you have the graft to come out there, you can aim there and come out um, singly. Um, there it is there, and you can, you can correct up to 25 degrees, and I've said this to the gentleman down here with the company, I think being able to correct 25 degrees is far too big, because really if you're 25 degrees out, you know, I'd like to see that at max about 10 or 15 degrees. Uh, I've seen the